You're listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. Hello, I'm Flight Lieutenant Peter Lisney, and in this episode, we'll discover how RAF Esports is combating isolation. We'll also reheat a few stories, just in case you missed them, but first, see if you can identify this noise. Find out if you're right at the end of this episode. Now, can online gaming beat lockdown isolation? And where is the line drawn between gaming enjoyment and gaming addiction? We asked our correspondent, LAC Emma Kerwin, to find out more from the RAF Esports Association, also known as the RAF Gamers Network, or RGN. This interview was recorded remotely, and there is occasional sound interference. I've gone through, um, frankly, a year from hell, and, and having that support network around me has helped me enormously. We see how people behave, you know, how they talk, their, their mannerisms online, and we're just looking for, for signs of people behaving differently. For me to have that competitive outlook there and still be able to get, get the cakes from it has been really, really helpful because I don't really know where that would have come from otherwise. Hi, it's LAC Emma Kerwin. I'm joined by Ken Pike, an MOD civil servant and public relations officer for the Esports Association. Sergeant Tia Gillen, based at RAF Honington, who's the expert regarding welfare. And SAC Tech Sam Arden, based at RAF Coningsby, who got involved with Esports over a year ago and is now leading the Call of Duty team called the Reapers. If I'm being honest, I've not played any video games since I was a teenager. Ken, is esports really competitive? You've got things like the Call of Duty games, you've got Overwatch, things like that, which are uh, highly competitive games where you are doing things like shoot 'em ups or or uh, stuff like that, where it's one on one or, or team on team, where you are going into direct competition. But esports isn't just about that; it's a, it's about a sort of a shared online experience. In, in many cases, at the other end of the scale, you've got things like Minecraft, Animal Crossing, uh, Stardew Valley, that are uh, sort of creator games, uh, what we call sandbox games, where you can create your own environment and there isn't necessarily any kind of competition in there you're not fighting against other people you're developing and creating things you're building houses in minecraft minecraft or you're expanding a, an animal village in animal crossing um so esports is is kind of what you want it to be it's there's as much or as little competition as you want it to be. There's as much or as little community play as you want it to be. Some people play entirely single player on their own and 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 and, and love it. And then other people want to be part of thousand person strong servers where they know hundreds of people and, and speak to them on a regular basis. And competitively, it can be from zero competition through to competing internationally against some of the best players in the world. The thing about esports is it's built from the communities that are behind it. You can't just have an esports team. It doesn't just appear. You have a community first that you build. And then from that community, whether it's esports at the lowest level or whether you're playing CSGO at the highest level, it all comes from the community. The people have to be in the community before the esports comes from that. You can make this whatever you want it to be. Um, it, it's quite surprising some of the people that, that you actually meet within the community that you wouldn't necessarily expect as the, the standard gamer type. Um, so yeah, don't knock it before you've tried it. Come on in, have a chat and see what you think. If I'm being honest, when I think about gaming, my initial thoughts are that it's quite an isolating thing to do. Sergeant Tia, is it isolating? Not only have I formed relationships with people that I would never have formed relationships with physically in person if I'd met them, um, not, not only externally, but actually internally on my own station. So I work in PSF, which is the main hub of, of the station, ideally, but I have met approximately nearly 30 people from my own unit internally that I have never seen or heard of before. Um, and, you know, we, I'm conscious that there's so many people living in SLA or or in married quarters, for that, for that matter, that 
don't necessarily socialise on camp with with serving personnel. So, you know, for the RAF Honington Hawks, it's been absolutely phenomenal. Um, it, it's 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 beyond amazing. And you know, those those contacts then, some of the really interesting stuff that we've seen has been internally between stations. So I've seen in our Discord group where a lot of people communicate that actually people are posted to new units. Um, they've used the RGN and members at different stations to actually contact them before they arrive at the new unit. Uh, which I think is absolutely phenomenal. So actually they're arriving at their new station already pre-prepared with information that they wouldn't have had before. And actually a group of friends that is already collated, ready, ready to go. So eSports is connecting people virtually and connecting people does seem to be particularly important during the pandemic to help reduce isolation. I understand that eSports is also trying to reduce that. So has eSports helped any of you during the pandemic? I've gone through... Um, frankly, a year from hell. And and having that support network around me has helped me enormously. Whether it's something as simple as, oh God, I feel a bit lonely because of because of lockdown or this is really getting to me, through to people who's who have had family bereavements or breakups or huge financial problems or career problems, you name it. We're such a big organization that it'd be surprising if we didn't have people turning up with issues here and there. And the fact that we've got this community that can persist through a lockdown without any barriers whatsoever. We've made new friends in this period that I would have never met under normal circumstances. uh, And we've supported each other, helped each other, been there for each other. It's just absolutely been fantastic. Can you tell me a little bit more about what has happened, Ken, and how has esports helped during a difficult time in your life? I've gone through a a personal breakup with two kids and a house involved and, and you know moving out of that environment where you've got your family around you and going through some very low times to say the least uh you know just again being able to turn on the computer and and find a friend you know there's people that that I speak to on a near nightly basis uh whom I I don't even know what they look like <laughs> but I'd class them as friends and they know things about me I know things about them we talk to each other you know they check up on you and and you know if you know they're going through a tough time you check up on them and and sometimes you you know you know we're not the kind of people that necessarily need constant sort of shoulders to cry on or anything like that but just someone to talk to and just to to unwind on and and say oh god I've had a awful week or or someone to say you're right mate and and have a virtual drink or in our case go and blow up enemy tanks or whatever it might be sam you're currently at home at the moment but what are your thoughts about the people who aren't and might be feeling isolated and living in blocks for the people that are they've got the opportunity to come and, and join this online community that we've got whether that be competitively or um just as a casual gamer they've got that opportunity there so they're never going to be isolated in the box i think the biggest thing is getting the word out there for people to get involved because i mean you've seen it with warzone it was kind of a perfect storm with the pandemic and warzone coming out people love the game um and it's blown up millions and millions of players so there's plenty of people out there playing games getting involved with each other just not necessarily in the community so obviously we want to try and bring everyone together so that there is an outlet there for people i know we've had uh, welfare cases in the past where we've helped people um, get through certain situations when they've needed us to be there. And that's obviously all built through this community we've got. Sergeant Tia, you're the expert regarding welfare support. What things are you looking out for regarding the mental health of servicemen and women who are involved in esports? You know, we look for certain signs and um, we really address them as soon as we see them. So the the fact that everybody is remote makes things a little bit tricky because that would, is a different kind of addressing. However, um, it's really, really quite quite effective and quite easy to do um you know we we form relationships with people within the community and we see how people behave you know how they talk their their mannerisms online so to speak rather than physically in person and we're just looking for for signs of people behaving differently the other part to this is that actually people find remote um online gaming a lot easier for them to communicate um, we we do that on a regular. That there's lots of talking online, and you know you can't see ranks, you can't see what people are wearing, you can't see their faces. Um, so people find it a lot more of a 
confidential and and a, an easier environment really to to talk about things. So we encourage that. And obviously, if there's anything identified that um, we think we can help or signpost or you know turn that from from social into work for, under a professional capacity, then then we do that. And it's actually been really effective. There's been quite a few um, welfare situations that have been spotted, raised, and dealt with efficiently and effectively. What are the other benefits and challenges of being part of esports within the RAF? I've been in the Air Force for 17 years. Uh, I have never developed at the rate that I have developed since I joined the RAF esports. Um, it's brought some amazing opportunities for me, as well as challenges. Um, but luckily, they have all been positive. I briefed at the Airspace Power Conference amongst one stars and above, which was absolutely phenomenal. Um, that allowed us to push out our message. That's the type of opportunity I would n- really never have come across should I have not been a member of the RAF esports world. Um, mentoring and development coaching, I mean, Ken and Wing Commander Penta have been absolutely golden when it's come to assisting and, and pushing me in the right direction. So I have learned so, so much from these guys, which is phenomenal. Um, and yeah, my, my confidence as a whole, it's made me a better manager. Um, remotely, especially during COVID, the skills that I have taken from the RGN and and the 300 people within the, in the COD community, um, and I've actually taken that, flipped it, reversed it, put it into work, on a, on a daily routine basis and it's seen my performance grow in my primary role as well as the secondary role so for me personally it's been phenomenal and, and we've seen that time and time again we've we've seen uh, I, 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 there's a, a woman called Steph who runs the Twitch channel she's gone from being who, somebody who was I think it's fair to say quite a, a timid individual a, a, you know a year and a half ago to someone who is now in charge of a team of 15 20 or so people who you know stream they moderate the channel they produce graphics and, and content uh, they produce output and events and, and and she runs all of that uh, under under sort of one of my my sub departments as it were and and that's incredible to see that that individual uh, leap in in capability and and leadership and, and communication skills and all those things. I also think it's really important to to mention how those attributes and skills also reflect in the workplace, um, and the level of progress that we make with communication, leadership, and you know all the other stuff that comes along with that decision making. The really important attributes that we use on a daily basis through through our primary roles. Um, it's development all round for for all different levels. You know all different ranks. And it's absolutely phenomenal to see that actually echoed then in in real time job performance. But also we've run a number of charity events. Uh, we do a number of things like merchandising and stuff like that. Uh, and all of these are have been run and set up by relatively junior people. I think one of the first things we ran was a charitable event uh, for, to raise money for cardiac risk in the young, it raised over three thousand pounds. It was all set up by an SAC. And it's quite surprising seeing people rise to that challenge because when you know, I work in media anyways uh, as part of my day job. So when I had uh, a chap called Ben come to me saying, oh, can we do this big media event and we want to raise loads of money and we want to stream it and all this kind of stuff, you go, OK, hang on, slow down. You start asking him all the questions about whether he's thought of X, Y and Z. And he just had all of the answers ready and, and he knew what he was doing and he was really well prepared. And you say, well, this isn't, you know, this is way above and beyond what we'd expect of somebody necessarily of, of his rank to achieve and, and to run. And the number of people that respond to him and, and, and answer to those people uh, and, and the just the general response across the association towards that has been absolutely fantastic and really encouraging. Um, and it kind of plays to all the things that the RAF wants to do in terms of empowering its workforce, generating a workforce of the future, technologically minded, uh, you know, young individuals who can take a team forward and, and deliver sort of results in, in, in events. You know, this is this is really a, a testament to that. How do you go about changing people's perceptions of gamers? I obviously talked to you about what mine are, about it being isolated and uh, a lot of dark rooms and things. But what are you lot really like? We do have a penchant for for, for dark rooms because you can see the screen better and, and RGB lights on our computers because it looks funny. But, uh, you know, that that's that's not a cultural thing. That's just a, an enjoyment thing. And, and the, you know, I've, my... Uh, current girlfriend she plays um animal crossing on on the switch and she's entirely different from that so it's there there is no one one mold or or type of person really 
it's it's much more forgiving and, and inclusive environment than I think you find in in almost any other walk, walk of life really um, certainly when you remove the the toxicity that you can find in sort of general public servers when you bring it into an RAF environment or a military environment and and actually I think that's even further demonstrated by when we do have competition with our assistor services uh, army and navy it's it's very different actually because like often you see a lot of banter and rivalry between the three services in the UK but when it comes to the esports side they're all incredibly supportive of each other and we help each other and we restream each other's channels and and we have competitions with each other and we big each other up and then the messages of support coming in to the to the reapers after code bowl from the navy and the army were fantastic there was no none there was no jealousy there was well, there's probably a little bit of jealousy but you know there was no nastiness there was it was just just really, really positive environment, which is fantastic to see. You know, people will say what they want to say, um, but you put a lot of time into playing the game, you get good at it. And you look at some of the, the top level esports players, they're on good money. So, you know, there's obviously a foundation there for it. Um, it's probably a little bit too late for me now, but there's certainly people that are younger than me that, are, that will join the RAF that will be a lot better than I am. Um, and I think we've seen a, a massive shift in the past sort of, definitely the past year, but the past sort of five years with, with Twitch, with YouTube, um, you've got a lot of young people coming through in esports who have watched people like Ninja. Um, for those that don't know, Ninja is a world famous streamer. Um, watch these streamers growing up playing games like Fortnite. Um, and that to them is what watching Steven Gerrard would have been to me. 10, 15 years ago. So we're going to see over the next 10 years, it's just going to be an exponential an exponential growth in esports. And there's no way it's not going to happen. For me, um, I play RAF hockey as well uh, for the under-23 team. Um, played a lot of football. Um, so for me, obviously, the past year, I've not been able to, to do any of these things. Um, and I am naturally a very competitive person. So to have the environment there for me to, um, with people that are like-minded, obviously, um, get involved in the competitive environment. I mean, we've got um, some really, really good COD players this year with uh, people like Bobby, Callie, Jamie and Nooney um, who who have teamed together with me personally. Um, we've played against some of the top um, amateurs in the European scene and not been embarrassed, which for me is good. So for me to have that competitive outlet there and still be able to get, you know, get the kicks from it is, uh, has been really, really helpful um, because I don't really know where that would have come from otherwise. Sticking with you, Sam, you're competitive, it seems. So how do you prevent yourself from getting burnt out? From um, a, a very competitive perspective, it's the same as any other sort of competitive environment. If you are constantly doing that thing for X amount of time, eventually you are going to get mentally burnt out anyway. So... For us, we, we often take breaks, whether it be, you know, 10, 15 minute, go get a snack um, or go outside for a walk. That helps us as players play better. It's, a, it's the same across the whole top level of esports. You won't see people sat there playing continuously for two, three, hour, uh, two, three four hours because they'll just get burnt out. So you'll see people practicing or playing for an hour and they'll go out and get a snack, get a drink, go for a walk. Um, so I think it kind of comes hand in hand to not sit there. Um, obviously, there's times where you, like when I review footage from from games, from practice or whatever, I'm sat there for a couple of hours um, looking at stuff and writing stuff down. But um, in terms of actually playing and competing, you don't sit there for that long because you do get burnt out and you do notice a drop in performance pretty rapidly. Um, and then you'll go for 15 minutes, especially if you're frustrated. You go for 15 minutes, come back new mindset you've refreshed yourself and then you can continue from there you you notice it very much so i agree with sam 100 percent. when we play world of tanks we're currently in the top 300 in europe teams which isn't massively high but you know it's a reasonably competitive level um and and you, if you sat down for the first hour or two we can sit there going wow wow great we're having great run of results here and then when you head into the sort of second or third hour, if, you, if you're if not careful, you start to say, oh, actually, our, our scores have suffered. 
and you start losing games that you shouldn't have lost because the concentration starts to wane. So I think there's a high degree of personal responsibility and, and actually uh, uh, our members are by and large very responsible for their own well-being. Uh, and, and they they're aware of that. They take their breaks. They they do other things. One of the tools that we like to use in the trade is is what I would call a walk and talk, um, where it, physically on a normal day to day basis we would take people out for welfare chats and and try to communicate better during a walk. Um, one of the best things about esports is obviously our remote capability, and there have been many occasions where I've actually been able to log into the PlayStation app via my mobile phone while I am out walking and continue to chat to the guys. Um, so almost call it a virtual walk and talk while I'm actually physically walking. So, you know, the the fact that we can log into that chat and discuss at any any point, whether we be inside or outside, really lends its hand to the fact that esports is so adaptable. At the moment, my own personal circumstances, I'm seven months pregnant. My husband is in Norway um, and maybe for quite some time so i have made some fantastic relationships that i will keep for an actual lifetime through the rgn um and I, it's so much appreciated you know it really makes home life a lot easier when you can actually at the flick of a button turn on the playstation and find all your friends online just for a chat the support system's there for me with the, the lads i play with um we quite often just sit in a party and talk about you know how how days have been how our weeks have been um also talk about sort of like you know what we could have done better as well um so it's a good environment to kind of learn from and and realistically it is a challenge because you know gamers are prone to sit down for long periods of time and and all the the, the various issues that go with that from you know the stereotype as, as we mentioned earlier of being um less fit and and sitting in a darkened room for for many hours uh when we run things uh like our sort of charity streamathons we've got one coming up this weekend in fact that's uh 20 hours to uh assist the british red cross uh in their fight against that uh, uh loneliness um and and we do make sure that we factor in break times for people when we organize these events to say, right, if you're going to be streaming for 20 hours, you need to make sure that you have regular breaks, you get yourself out for at least an hour in the middle of that, uh, preferably more often than that even. And, and we do have a duty of care to people when we organize uh, events, but when it's when it's individual gamers, we, we you know, that's, that's down to the individual to, to manage their own. Uh, capabilities and I think most people in the REF are aware of, of the requirements for that because that's something that you get taught as part of daily life in the REF anyway uh, whether you've got a desk job or whether you're in a combat zone you're, you're, you're taught you know that your mental state matters and and that your physical state matters and and that you know if you're it's the same if you if you're in a battlefield and you allow yourself to get dehydrated that's classed as 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 you failing in your duties you are told you know make sure that you look after yourself you don't you don't get sunstroke you don't get heat stroke you don't get you know uh dehydration because that's your personal responsibility to make sure that you're okay and the same counts in in an esports environment you have a personal responsibility to yourself but you'll be supported by senior hierarchy when it comes to, you know, group led events. I think as well, just to add to Ken's point there, you know, education is key and we have delivered a presentation to the Defence Mental Health Network um, as the RF Honington Hawks, where we discuss gaming addiction um, and, you know, signposting of how we would deal with that effectively and quickly at, at the earliest possible level, should we see any signs of that in and amongst our people. Where is the line drawn between online gaming addiction and all of the benefits that we've talked about? It's a tough one. <laughs> and it's a tough one that the industry has been grappling with uh, itself across the board. I think there, you know, there is uh, a danger of addiction uh, for some people. I think that uh, within the RAF esports environment, that danger is broken up by the fact that we have other responsibilities and other duties, and the fact that our members are aware, as I said, of, of their own personal responsibilities to carry out their tasks. And we have had one or two individuals that have gotten a bit carried away on occasion. Um, I know that Wing Commander Penta dealt with one individual uh, relatively early on in our uh, uh, formation that, that essentially had to have quiet words with him and say look you need to pay more attention to what you're doing in in your work life you know in your work time uh, and your work life balance and your personal work you know lifetime 
because gaming can take over. It is fun. It is a form of escapism. But usually what we find is that people who are diving too deep into the gaming world are doing so for a reason. They want to escape something. They're going through a bad patch, whatever it might be. And, and that escape is often temporary. Um, and, and they can be helped by you know that community feel that we've spoken about earlier. And if it's not temporary or it's uh, part of a longer thing, then yeah, of course that can become a problem. And we're here, you know, people like Tia, myself and Dan, keep an eye on our members and, and our team leads and game leads keep an eye on their members. And if they start to see people who are online, you know, 10, 11, 12 hours a day, you start to go, hang on, why aren't you in the office today? <laughs> you know, what's going on, buddy? And and just that process of, of looking out for each other generally catches those. Uh, I don't think we've got too many cases or any cases for that matter of people who are a dangerous addiction level gaming at the moment. What are the cybersecurity risks with online gaming? We actually quite early on uh, came across a, 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 an attack on us. Um, we were setting up the cardiac risk in the young events and we'd put together some graphics posters. Um, and within a couple of weeks after that, you know, to, 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 to tell people this was happening, within a couple of weeks after the event, very similar uh, sort of piece of graphical content came through with the same sort of graphics, the same typefaces, asking our members to take part in a, an online survey of some sort. And it set alarm bells ringing very quickly because we're going hang on who who started this who where's this come from and and they used our graphics and stuff and and it just, luckily we've got uh, you know we've got 1100 plus members who are very digitally savvy you know there's a lot of c4i uh staff that work for us you know, guys that work uh, guys and women that work in, in computers anyway and are very aware of the cyber implications we've got a cyber lead within the uh, senior leadership team who whose specific task it is to look out for these kinds of things. And and in that instance, we very quickly dealt with it. A message was very quickly sent around saying, do not answer this, do not open it, report it as appropriately uh, when you see it. This is not an official uh, thing. And we've got very quick lines of communication between us. We use Discord, WhatsApp groups, uh, Teams pages, you name it, uh, that can very quickly spread that message of any impending threat. And having a community of digitally savvy individuals does mean that we're that much more alert to those kinds of problems when they do arise. But they can arise and they do arise. And of course, you know, whenever you're online, you know, your personal uh, security is uh, potentially at risk. And that doesn't matter who you are, whether you're in the forces or, or elsewhere. Um, but in the forces, we have the added issue of operational security and personal security in the military context. And, and if you don't know who you're talking to, that can become an issue. Um, we do have guidance we give our players. Um, we have the standard guidance that's part of the REF's uh, usual uh, operation processes, uh, and and those so far have been very robust. They adapt and evolve as the threat adapts and evolves the way that we do for any threat, uh, and we continue to keep on top of that. Um, just really to mirror what, what Ken said, we have annual competencies regarding security um, that we complete as, as regular serving personnel. Uh, that brings to the forefront of our mind, you know, our social media accounts and our actual online footprint. Um, I don't think that there is any additional risk as long as we are following the guidelines and procedures that are already set out to us. As a member of a military service, are any of the risks greater to you, do you think? Cybersecurity is an ever-increasing threat for everyone. Um, and I think the fact that we're an organization that is very aware of that and we share that information with our members and, and we share best practice with our members means that we're in a better position, actually, to, to make sure that our members are operating within our community rather than being part of external chat forums. You know, they, they come to us to game rather rather than going elsewhere to game and, and being in the wide, you know, the dangerous wide world kind of thing. If there's a parent listening to this whose child always seems to be playing online games, what are the positives and negatives of that? So we recently had a um, MOD civil servant approach regarding her children and she had no experience with gaming uh, whatsoever. So she engaged with the RGN to find out um, a little bit about the actual gaming process. She thinks she was using an Xbox and we gave her some security settings advice for her children and the parental responsibilities surrounding that. She found it really helpful, got really good positive feedback from her. And yeah, so there's a, a prime example of how, you know, that, that works well. I'd say share 
share their experience, understand them, join them. I, I've I've got a, a young son and a daughter. My daughter's seven. My son is ten. And I've actually found it an incredibly positive experience uh, joining in their games. You know, they play Minecraft. Uh, yeah, I would say that you know, be aware of what they're playing because there are Peggy ratings that that indicate age appropriateness. Um, you know, be aware that they are having a diverse mixed lifestyle that they are also getting out and eating healthily and, and doing exercise and playing in the field but you know uh, whatever time period you allocate to them being allowed to game whether that's half an hour or or more per day or you know depending on age group as long as you're aware of that online environment then there shouldn't be any hidden surprises there and there are surprises out there certainly for younger people there are there are dangers there are there are people out there that will will prey on the younger and 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 prey on anyone who's vulnerable um so as a parent myself uh, i think it's hugely important that that you're aware of what your kids are doing you wouldn't you know if you have young kids you wouldn't let them play in the park unsupervised you wouldn't just leave them in the playground and go home for you know an hour or two and think that that was okay so a digital environment is no different really um and actually it can be a lot of fun you, you if you struggle to connect with your kids uh, you struggle to get them to say more than two words about what they did at school today. Tell you what, start talking to them about what they're doing on Minecraft or Fortnite or whatever, and you might get a bigger answer because that's what they care about. That's what they're interested in. That's where they're having fun. And you can turn that into an, 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 an educational environment. And finally, what do you think the future holds for esports within the RAF? So much, so much. It, it, our estimates are that, you know, something like 40 to 60 percent of young people play computer games and and you know when we talk about our numbers we can only see our numbers going up and up and up when we think of the younger generations coming through and entering Holton and Cranwell so numbers obviously can just keep increasing but where do we go from there we, we want to see uh, competition at the highest level I had a conversation with uh, the Air Commodore uh, from the sports board uh, I joked about the elite athlete status. The REF has elite athletes and other sports that go off and compete at national and international level as you know, rugby players, football players, you name it. And I said, oh, you know, if, uh, if Sam and his team win the Code Bowl, then we'll be talking about elite athlete status next week then, sir. And he... I, I, I was joking, but he took that very seriously. And, and we actually had a proper discussion about it. And he said, yeah, absolutely. This is a conversation that's worth having. So, you know, that's not, we're not there yet. Uh, but the future may hold something along those lines if, you know, if, if things go well. Um, and just being a, a, a resource for everyone in the RAF, or, you know, there are people that may not engage with that, but, but we're available to everyone in the RAF. And then competing on events like Insomnia, the big games festival that happens every year, going to international events even, you know, the possibility of sending Sam and his team to America next year so that we don't have issues with uh, long distance uh, speeds of uplink and stuff like that, which prevented Sam's team from directly taking on the Space Force. They had to sort of take on community uh, teams to and then aggregate their scores and stuff. Whereas if we actually went over to the States and competed head to head, they would have been able to directly one on one take that team on and, and that could have been a very different result again um so yeah international competition uh, expanding our uh, uh membership base making sure that we are diverse in in all aspects of what we do uh, there are plenty of women in our association but actually we'd like to see far more the 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 the, the number still doesn't match parity in terms of when we talk about diversity and, and and the numbers of people in the air force that represent male female uh or or different races and things like that we want to make sure that people understand that, that you're all welcome from a serving perspective i really want to see rf esports become normalized so to speak um you know for people to hear rf esports and think of it in a positive light before a negative light um and i, I believe not to quote myself, but I believe we're the second biggest organisation um, in the Air Force um, next to football. So I'd hope for the future that maybe it's possible that we our membership might grow and we would overtake football. That would be absolutely fantastic to see. Um, and just to, to continue to see the newer generations coming into the Air Force and using the network for, for the advantages that it has, ideally. Thank you all for joining me to talk about esports. You might even have a new member now. You've actually really opened my eyes to it. Yeah, yeah. and and uh, 
you know, you're totally welcome to join. It just ping us a, a message on the RAF Esports Facebook group. Uh, for anyone who does want to join, that's the best way to get in touch is um, RAF Esports Facebook, and we'll get you into the community channels. And there's really a space for everyone, whether you're playing Animal Crossing or Candy Crush, or whether you're playing Counter Strike or Overwatch or Call of Duty or anything in between. It's it really is a, a very warm, friendly environment. I'm LAC Victoria Andrews with a look back at some recent news from the RAF. This is Reheat on Inside Air. The Sentinel Or-1 aircraft has touched down for the final time after 14 years of service. In that time, the platform conducted nearly 5,000 sorties, accumulating over 32,000 hours of flying time. Commanding Officer of No. 5 Army Cooperation Squadron Wing Commander Dominic Holland said how the Sentinel had delivered exceptional results on multiple operations across the globe. The aircraft has been decommissioned as massive investments are made in the next generation of iStar platforms. The Poseidon, Wedgetail, Protector, Rivet Joint and Shadow have either entered service or will do so in the near future. Looking at well-being now, The first edition of the RAF Mental Health Network's newsletter, Thinking Out Loud, is available to read online. In these difficult times, the newsletter is an ideal way to find out more about the RAF Mental Health Network, the work they do to end mental health stigma, and the support they can provide. And finally, a look now at what's been popular on RAF social channels recently. 190,000 people engaged with the post about Max, the English Springer Spaniel who has received the PDSA Order of Merit which recognises the comfort and support he offers people worldwide. Another 100,000 followers read about the delivery of Covid vaccines to the Ascension Islands and on the RAF YouTube page you can immerse yourself in a 360 degree virtual video experience which explores the role of RAF police. That's Reheat on Inside Air. I'm SAC Simon Ross with this episode's Name That Noise. That was the unmistakable sound of a Lancaster bomber from the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. A crew of seven men would be stationed throughout the Lancaster, including the bomb aimer in the nose of the aircraft who would lay prone over the emergency escape hatch. At the tail end of the aircraft sits the rear gunner, in a space so cramped their parachute would often hang in the fuselage instead. Behind the wireless operator you will find the main spars for the wing, a major obstacle for the crew to navigate at the best of times. And speaking of obstacles, mind your head as you pass beneath the mid-upper gunner, who sits on a hanging piece of rectangular canvas overhead. With its long and versatile bomb bay, the Lancaster could be adapted to carry loads of up to 22,000 pounds, the largest payload of any bomber during the war. It was also capable of flying home on only two of its four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. Thanks to the aircrew and ground crew of today's BBMF, the Lancaster continues to be a flying icon for the Royal Air Force. That's all for this episode of Inside Air. Please give us a review and subscribe on your favourite podcast app and join us again soon. You've been listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. If you're serving in the RAF and have a story for us, please speak to your unit media and communications officer. Inside Air is written and produced for the Royal Air Force by RAF Media Reserves.